Hello. Welcome to 37th and the World, the official podcast of the Georgetown Journal of International Affairs. Gagia is the student-run flagship publication of Georgetown University's School of Foreign Service. On 37th and the World, we dive into key global trends and speak directly with the experts working on these issues in areas ranging from conflict and security, human rights and development, science and technology, society and culture, and global governance. In the following conversation, the Georgetown Journal of International Affairs sat down with Dr. Irvand Abrahimian, Distinguished Professor of History at Baruch College and the Graduate Center of the City of New York. Dr. Abrahimian, an Iranian-American, has long been a prominent historian of modern Iran who has focused much of his work on the country's secular leftist opposition movements. He previously taught at Princeton University New York University, and Oxford University, and is a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. This conversation, which took place in the days ahead of the U.S. presidential elections, took the opportunity to explore prospects for a policy shift on both sides of the American-Iranian relationship, from the maximum pressure campaign pursued by the Trump administration ever since withdrawing from the 2015 Iran nuclear deal in May 2018. Dr. Abrahamian is a harsh critic of the approach taken by President Trump and Secretary of State Pompeo, in which strict sanctions, embargoes, and diplomatic isolation squeeze Iran's oil-dependent economy to the point where Tehran's current regime either topples or agrees to give up far more than it did in the 2015 agreement, called the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. To its opponents, This approach hasn't only been a policy failure and an unwarranted punishment against the lives of ordinary Iranians struggling to manage the economic and social pressures of the Islamic Republic. Indeed, critics like Dr. Ibrahimian accentuate how the severity and combativeness of U.S. policy in the past four years have turned the tide of domestic Iranian politics further to the hardline right and put any reformist agenda out of commission ahead of Iran's own presidential elections in the middle of 2021. President-elect Biden pledged to return to the Iran nuclear deal which he originally backed as vice president. In a 2020 campaign in which foreign policy played almost no role, this was one of the only objectives mentioned. It was a direct repudiation of major foreign policy claimed by Trump. But a lot has changed since the shift in 2018. Tehran's rightward move and largely discredited reformist camp has hardened its stance. Iran is now making new demands on Biden, like no renegotiation of the nuclear deal and its insistence on being compensated for economic losses from sanctions. It won't be easy to go back in time. Dr. Abrahamian addresses another critical issue for those who think squeezing Iran can work. Iranians especially the 65% of the country under 35 years old, may be gradually moving away from the Islamist focus of their government. Ever since the 79 revolution, foreign analysis of Iran's government and internal political process has been frequently cast in terms of balance and competition between hardliners and moderates or reformists. And, you know, as a paradigm through which to understand this foreign policy, this doesn't seem to be questioned very often by the foreign policy establishments in the U.S. So my question is, do you think there has been kind of a breakdown in the paradigm You know, is it still useful to look at Iranian politics in terms of hardliners versus moderates, or has just been an overall fundamental shift to the right? No, I think it's a very acute, good question, and it basically goes to the heart of the issue. Um, Since the revolution, Iran has had real politics. It's not like, you know, it's... uh, monolith, there have been real politics, different groups competing. Right. And 
on in, internally there have been you could I call them conservatives versus reformers. Right. And um, one of the prominent reforming pro, uh, presidents was Khatami in the 1990s, who actually wanted to much more open up the system. And he also wanted to normalize relations with the West. Right. Um, now the situation is not uh, so much between reformers and conservatives, it's much more between, I would call them moderates, that uh, they, uh, Rouhani, the president, is not really a reformer, but he, he wants to uh, be much more moderate in internal policies, but also continue Khatemi's foreign policy, which was to have a rapprochement with the West. Right. Uh, but he's confronted, as Khatemi was, by much more right-wing um, elements, Islamist elements, um, who uh, the strength is not just in the military, in the Revolutionary Guards, they also have a hard core in the electorate. It's about over 30, 40 percent of the electorate usually votes uh, for uh, uh, conservative candidates. Right. Uh, and Foreign policy, especially the nuclear policy, comes into this conflict between I would I, nowadays call the moderates versus uh, right wingers. Um, in that, uh, Rouhani basically put his reputation, his government's reputation, on the nuclear deal uh, with Obama. And the conservatives always said, you know, don't trust Americans. They they will not commit, uh, fulfill their commitments. Uh, you best not to deal with them. And with the Trump administration, basically the the, uh, the, the right wing they say, "See, we told you so. Right. Uh, you were wrong. You, you should never sign this agreement. You, you forced us to limit our enrichment, and uh, they've pulled the rug from under us." Um, and so this has undermined uh, Rouhani's administration, which is very dangerous because his uh, his term is up uh, in early next year. There'll be new elections for president. Right. And I have no doubt that some right-winger, if the question is extreme right or just right-winger, will win the presidency. And the conservatives have already won the parliament. So with the presidency and parliament in the hands of the, basically people who had opposed Rouhani and are, are much more to the right, um, they'll be in charge. And it's going to make it very d difficult for any type of improvement in relations with the United States. Right. Right. So, uh, so do you think that being like uh, aggressive towards Iran, um, so actually played into the hands of the hardliners, um, and you know, I guess how does the U.S. revive revive the moderates in Iran? Yes, it's the first time. It's uh, American foreign policy has actually three times undercut. Uh, I would say liberals, reformers in Iran. Um, the first time was actually with the overthrow of Dr. Mossad back in '53. Then it was undermining Khatemi. Mm -hmm. uh, at that time, again, Khatemi actually offered to, to negotiate the nuclear issue with uh, the Bush administration. And he also uh, was willing to basically put his. Um, reputation online to improve relations and he was slapped with the axis of evil speech and so that undermined that administration. He was then replaced by Ahmadinejad who was a real right-wing populist right. who 
started attacking Israel and the United States in rhetoric. Uh, so now the third time is the undermining of Rouhani, and uh, whatever happens, it's 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 helped barely the coming to power of uh, carbon conservatives. Right, right, absolutely. Um, so, do do you th- so I guess. Do you have um, specific like, criticisms then of um, Trump's Iran policy in terms of like how deepening uh, diplomatic isolation and through sanctions and embargoes and by you know abandoning the uh, nuclear deal like ha- specific criticisms for how that has become disastrous for relations? Yes, I mean the is. Trump's uh, denunciation of the uh, of the nuclear agreement was really unjustified. I, I don't know if you really read the deal. It's a very complicated deal, but right. the bottom line was it, it succeeded what he wanted to do, which was to make sure Iran would not be on uh, on the verge of making a nuclear bomb. Right. Uh, because during the period of um, refusal to talk with Iran, Iran had uh, basically stepped up all its enrichment and was pretty close to building a bomb if it wanted to. Right. And the fear was that Iran would then create the bomb. This would then spark off a war in the Middle East because Israel would then have to attack Iran. So the new, uh, what, Trump, uh, what uh, Obama did actually very cleverly was made a deal that uh, put aside other issues. There are other issues between the U.S. and Europe, but put the, those issues aside because for him and for the world, the most important thing was the nuclear bomb. And mm-hmm. by solving that, I think he really did had a major success. Trump comes along and says, well, no, we want an overall agreement. This isn't good enough. Uh, but when you and you pull out of the agreement, uh, if you really want to negotiate some new agreement, you have to offer something substantial. And Pompeo didn't do that, actually. He came up with uh, 12 demands of Iran before they could negotiate. And if you look at these demands, they're basically uh, demands for unconditional surrender. Right. There's no way that Iran could possibly negotiate under those terms. Um, you know, there's an old saying uh, of Clemenceau saying that Woodrow Wilson uh, came with 14 commandments. The good Lord only had 10 commandments. And right. the 10 commandments are hard enough to obtain. <laughs> right. The 14 are impossible. <laughs> it's the same with, uh, with Pompeo. He came up with these 12 demands that really left no room for Iran to be able to renegotiate. Uh, So obviously they said no, and their expectation is hopefully uh, there will be a new administration in Washington which will not not, uh, uh, demand uh, starting from scratch, which would basically try to fine-tune what already to, uh, was assigned between Iran and the five plus one at the UN and uh, it was, the, it was the Obama agreement, uh, fine-tune that to make it much more palatable for the American Congress. But uh, yeah. I, there's no way, uh, especially with hardliners in power in Iran, they're going to submit to uh, uh, the, the Trump demands. Right. So, right, I, I mean, bring interesting points, so because, you know, the foreign policy issues don't get very much airtime in the current U.S. elections. Do you have any sense of a policy, a policy shift under Biden? Like, do you think he will pursue uh, reviving the nuclear deal? And is that what you would recommend? Yes, I'm, I'm sure. I mean, he hasn't talked about it. It's wise not to talk about it. It's not something that's going to win votes. Uh, right. But I think the people advising him will be very similar to the same people who were in the um, um, 
Obama administration. Right. And they were very much committed to that deal. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if Kerry was again appointed Secretary of State because it, much of the work was done by him. And he has a very good image in, in Iran. And I think he's the sort of person who could be trusted in, in Iran for uh, any uh, renegotiations. Right. Right. That makes that makes a lot of sense. Um, do you mind if I just quickly shift back to some of you know the internal pol- political situation? Um, so like I understand that you're an expert in the Mossadegh area and the Tuda party, and I understand how secular uh, leftist parties did play a role in the revolution until they were pushed out by Khomeini. Um, in recent years, when outsiders look at opposition in Iran. You know, what we see are these young protests that don't seem to have very much political organization behind them. Do you think, or how do you see the prospect for organized secular opposition to the regime now? Uh, No, there is no organized, I mean, the only organized opposition is the Mujahideen, which is uh, basically a sect, a, a cult. Uh, it's well, well organized because it's very disciplined and it's basically based on uh, one man. Uh, so there's, you, you can't really have political discussions or uh, splits in it. it. It acts as like a robot, uh, but it has a lot of money, so it gets a lot of visibility. The money probably comes from the Saudis. Right. Um, and it has some influence in uh, American politics because it spreads money around. People like uh, Giuliani received money from him. Genrich was on their payroll. And apparently our next Supreme Court uh, member was also actually represented them, something that hasn't been mentioned in the press much. Right. Uh, but Barrett apparently worked as their attorney in Washington. So they have that influence. But that does actually um, undermines U.S. influence in Iran because uh, they're so dis- disliked in Iran as a terrorist, uh, fanatical, basically, cult, cult right. that most Iranians would rather prefer the Islamic Republic than uh, having a cult uh, figure around their country. So it, it, it doesn't help the United States to be represented by the Mujahideen. Right. The royalists are, are very sort of uh, sidelined. They don't have much influence. They, in Los Angeles, they have some influence. But on the whole, um, the emigre community is uh, much more for, so on the sidelines just watching the situation. It's not organized. Um, and uh, many people, in fact, Iranians, even if they don't like the Islamic Republic, uh, they feel that the United States is actually uh, being inhumane with the uh, sanctions. Uh, to, uh, basically, right. the people who are suffering most are the ordinary citizens. Right. And the latest, uh, latest uh, information was that even ordinary uh, flu shots Iran can't buy from Europe because of the sanctions. So this directly affects, you know, the average Iranian. Right, right absolutely. People usually think, well, the Iranians are going to blame the Islamic Republic, but they're just as likely to blame the United States for uh, um, sanctions for hardships. Right. So, you know... You know, the government has done pretty well up until now um, under the guise of Islam by creating like an essentially the, like this welfare state economically um, by like co-opting socialist policies that, um, you know, that has really distracted from organized opposition. But because of the sanctions, this is all falling apart. And is this why we are now seeing protests? Because like this welfare state is falling apart? Uh, well, Islam is 
was used vaguely as an ideology, but they're pretty pragmatic about how they implement Islam. It, the main symbolic thing becomes, in fact, the question of uh, women having to wear the veil. Right. Uh, not the veil, but the headscarf. And there's also flexibility about what the headscarf is and how far it covers the hair or not. Right. But on other issues, you find the system is actually quite uh, pragmatic or you could say opportunistic. It, uh, its main interest is basically to survive and uh, retain support in the population. So its economic policies have been much more around uh, welfare programs, right. um, education, medicine, um, uh, social services to the countryside. And in some ways, they're, they're much, I mean, the, the, the word welfare state has uh, come unpopular in America, but in Iran, it's uh, succeeded. I think the main reason it's a success survived actually 40 years is because it implemented uh, 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 social programs. Right. Uh, so if you look at the educational system, it's huge expansion since 79. In uh, medical services, huge expansion. In fact, uh, life expectancy is in fact uh, almost as good as uh, 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 America at the moment. Right. Uh, mainly because because of uh, medical facilities into the countryside, uh, sanitation into the countryside. So these things are often forgotten, but I think for the average Iranian, uh, that, that explains that although there are protests, economic protests, on the whole, the state has done fairly well right. in uh, so meeting uh, needs. And now, of course, there is because of the economic uh, pressures, things uh, are difficult. But I think people who lived through the last forty years realize there have been important changes. Right. No, that that makes a lot of sense. But in in the case of the young people, like if you know there is like a foreseeable demographic time bomb, and you know, do you think the U.S. should have any? part in supporting the, like such reformists, or do you think they should totally stay out of it in order to not taint any um, movements with, with their uh, sway? Well, in the, among the young, actually, it, you have to look at a, a different class situation, especially in terms of city, country. The right. young people in the cities who got educated, high school, university educated in the last 20 years, they want more reform, opening up of the system. They were the people who supported uh, uh, Atemi and uh, less so Rouhani right. uh, because they they don't want overthrow of the system, they don't want another revolution, but they do want opening up. Um, they were the people who protested in 2009 about the um, contested uh, presidential elections. Right. Uh, large numbers came out there, and they, you would say, you describe as basically, I think, uh, reformist, uh, liberal opposition. Um, but in uh, last year, when there were demonstrations, uh, mostly on economic issues, in the provinces, uh, this is because of the hardships on um, on prices, jobs, and so on. Um, there, the youth in the more provincial towns were demonstrating. But interesting enough, this, the youth in the Tehran, uh, the liberal youth of Tehran in 2009, they stayed home. They were not interested in, in those protests. So mm -hmm. it's much more complicated about um, 
uh, people's attitudes towards the regime. Right. And there are a lot of youth, of course, in the villages who uh, joined the Revolutionary Guards. And I would say they're the sort of the hardcore of this regime. Um, these are not liberal youth, they're conservative youth from fairly traditional uh, village backgrounds who benefited from the revolution and have easy access into the military service. Right, right. Oh, that's, that's really interesting, that distinction. Um, do, you, do you have any other you know, shifts that you think is worth um, noting in terms of either the internal political situation or relationship with the U.S.? Internal situation, I think, long term, which is very quart and underlying, which people often ignore, is, you know, in 1979, the whole revolution, the whole uh, discourse of the revolution was Islam. Right. Uh, Islam was the solution. Islam would solve the problems and so on. Um, and what you have seen, I think, over the four decades, that has declined. And the discourse is actually much more a question of uh, the Enlightenment discourse of individual rights. Uh, what are the limitations? of religion, uh, how much can Islam solve actual social economic problems. And so there's, a, I would say, a deep-seated cultural change that has come through the yeah. country. Okay. So in a way, it's, 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 a, it's a sort of silent secularization of the public. And that, in the long run, helps, of course, uh, the reformers or the moderates. Um, so if Iranian politics was left on its own, there weren't foreign external pressures, I think it would have a good possibility of democratization because for the first time really in the public, there is a culture that has, uh, resonates with um, the notions of basically uh, liberty and equality. And these ideas, of course, were there in Iran in the 1906 revolution, but by the 1970s, they had been submerged in the whole the language of Islam and the propaganda of Islam. This is 37th and the World. Thank you to Dr. Irvan Abrahamian and our interviewer, Nicole Weinrush. Please be sure to subscribe and leave a comment and rating on whichever streaming platform you use. To read this interview and other insightful interviews and articles, please check out gajia, gjia.georgetown.edu. Thank you for listening and see you next time.